Hello and welcome to CDP Presents, our monthly webinar series. We are so happy to have you all with us today. And if you've joined us before, as always, welcome back. I am Je Dr. Jenna Ermold, Assistant Director of Training and Education and um, as, at the Center for Deployment Psychology at the Uniformed Services University and part of the CDP Presents team. I am just loving the chat this morning. It is so fabulous to see where everybody is from, from Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Massachusetts. I even saw a few Colorados, that's where I'm hailing from, San Antonio, Michigan, Florida, and really excited to have somebody joining us from the Ukraine, somebody from Colombia, from, somebody from Nova Scotia. So we've got an international uh, crew here as well. India, that's amazing. Um, so we are thrilled that you were able to join us today um, and very excited for today's webinar. Um, just wanted to uh, give a quick disclaimer that this project is sponsored by the Uniform Services University. However, the information or content and conclusions do not necessarily represent the official position or policy of, nor should any official endorsement be inferred on the part of the USU Department of Defense or the US government. As always, I also wanna give you a quick snapshot of some great upcoming training opportunities. Uh, next month, I mean, obviously today, sorry, we have our uh, co-occurring substance use disorder and prolonged exposure. We'll be offering uh, cognitive behavior therapy for suicide prevention at the end of June. There's still some spots for that if you're interested. Next month, we'll be having dancing with ambivalence in psychotherapy moving between motivational interviewing and EBPs with balance and grace with uh, Anna, Dr. Anna Brewer, who has been with us before, and she's a fabulous speaker. Uh, dyadic interventions involving significant <clears throat> others in suicide prevention in September, um, and debunking common misperceptions about sleep interventions in November. So uh, all, all of those registrations are open. Please do check out our upcoming training page. Uh, saw somebody from Poland as well. So again, we are, we're really excited to have some, some of our international friends in, in Colombia again. Uh, as Micah just put the link in the chat for the handouts for today. So do, do be sure to, to download those. Uh, if you missed last month's webinar, it was fabulous. Psychological practice with transgender and gender nonconforming service members and veterans. You can check out that recording on our, on our uh, again, on that, and the link at the bottom there in the archived webinars. Um, and it was a really, really fantastic one. So share it if you, if you liked it and you want to revisit it, go ahead. If you want to sh share it with your colleagues, please do. Or if you missed us, check it out there. Um, CDP is excited to continue, oops, I got excited and I over, over clicked. Uh, CDP is excited to continue to offer our podcast, Practical for Your Practice. This bi-weekly podcast features stories, ideas, support, and actionable intel to empower providers to keep working toward implementing EBPs with fidelity and effectiveness. Uh, so do be sure to check out all the fantastic episodes in season one. And we are really thrilled to announce that we have released uh, already three episodes so far for season two. Um, and this, is, this has included uh, making an uncomfortable conversation more comfortable, collaborating with our clients, to increase mean safety, and that's CDP's own Sharon Berman. Uh, the, the next one is Stress is Your Friend, Reinterpreting Stress as Fuel for Performance with Dr. Gabe Paoletti. And the third one is Making Cognitive Health a Priority in Practice, Getting Back to Basics with Compensatory Cognitive Training um, and CogSmart. And this was with Dr. Elizabeth Twomley, who also actually presented a fabulous webinar for us as part of this series. So please check it out. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite platform. Uh, before I introduce our speaker for today, just some housekeeping uh, Zoom features orientation that everybody probably already knows. You may have entered in full screen mode and that can make using some of the features more challenging. So if you did, go ahead and just click on your screen and hit escape. Um, and we do recommend if possible, if you have headphones and you can use those to listen, that doesn't uh, help with the audio. While I'm talking, check the volume level on your computer and adjust as needed. Many of you have already found that chat feature. Um, 
which you can find by hovering over the bottom of your screen. This is a fantastic place to not only introduce yourself, but to enter questions, respond to any questions our speaker might pose, or even interact with each other. Um, I will be moderating the questions and asking uh, them to Dr. Back in the final 10-ish minutes of our presentation today. Also, if you experience any tech di technical difficulty, feel free to put that problem in the chat and uh, Mr. Norgard will reach out and assist you. Uh, he usually does that privately. Uh, and if you notice there is in that blue, there's a little drop down. It, it sometimes it auto selects to um, not everyone's. So it, it might auto select to host and panelists. Please do select everyone so that everybody gets to see what your questions are, your observations, things like that. So use the everyone drop down. Uh, the webinar series will be recorded and uh, posted on our uh, website. Handouts for today, again, are on your CE21 My Account page. And uh, Mr. Norgar does keep posting the link as well. Uh, so make sure you download those so you can have a copy of a PDF of the slides. At the end of the webinar, Mr. Norgard will provide information and instructions on how to obtain CEs. A reminder, in order to obtain CE credit, you must attend the entire webinar and complete the webinar survey in CE21. We are offering American Psychological Association CE credits, which are acceptable to most state licensing boards for different mental health disciplines. Just be sure to check the requirements for your state uh, or country and retain any documentation associated with the training. And now without any further ado, it is my absolute extreme pleasure. We are so excited to have Dr. Sudi back with us today. Uh, she received her PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Georgia and completed her clinical internship training with specialization in treatment of substance use disorders at Yale University School of Medicine. She then completed her postdoctoral training at the Medical University of South Carolina in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. She joined the Medical University of South Carolina faculty in 2005 and is currently a professor and director of addiction science division and the NIH sponsored diversity <clears throat> in addiction research training, excuse me, program. Her primary research interests focus on the treatment of substance use disorders and co-occurring post-traumatic stress disorder. She is involved in both psychosocial, behavioral, and pharmacological treatment trials, as well as laboratory-based and neuroimaging studies. So thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Beck, and I will turn things over to you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Armald. It's wonderful to be here. Um, I've loved watching the chat as well, seeing so many people from all across the country and internationally, um, it's wonderful. So thanks again for the opportunity to be here today to talk about uh, treating PTSD and co-occurring substance use disorders using prolonged exposure. Um, can you hear me okay? You sound great. Okay, terrific. Okay, I'll turn my video off while I'm presenting, but I just wanted to say hi to everyone and welcome. And, Let's see, I only need to know how to have the button. There we go, thank you. All right, so now I can forward on. I'm here in Charleston, South Carolina. I also saw that there was another person, at least one other person um, in the chat who is um, joining us from South Carolina as well. And I'm here at um, the Medical University in the Ralph H. Johnson VA. So I wanna acknowledge I want to acknowledge um, a lot of individuals. These are some of the, the main folks um, on our team and, and, and our collaborators who, uh, who have made the work that I'm going to be talking about today um, possible, who have supported the research and the treatment that we're doing, um, and also, of course, um, the agencies that have supported us um, and supported this work, um, including the VA and the DOD and NIH. For disclosures, um, the COPE trials, and I'll, I'll talk about COPE, uh, the COPE treatment, um, and tell you everything about what that is. Those have been sponsored through NIDA and NIAAA, um, and the therapy manuals are published um, through Oxford University Press. So I did want to um, share that disclosure. And then uh, what we'll talk about, what I'm going to share about today is um, describing the relationship between PTSD and substance use disorders. Uh, talk about the benefits of, of providing prolonged exposure trauma-focused treatment 
to individuals with PTSD and co-occurring SUD and describe the clinical application. So for the overview of PTSD and SUD, uh, many of you I'm sure are, are familiar with PTSD, but just very briefly, um, PTSD is a chronic condition that can develop after ex exposure to a Criterion A event. Um, those are wide and vary and can include combat, um, other events related to military service, car accidents, natural disasters, child abuse. The symptoms of PTSD are re-experiencing, uh, so re-experiencing the event through memories or nightmares, Avoidance um, is a key, uh, key symptom that I'm going to be focusing on today of trauma-related stimuli. Um, and we think of the substance use, um, excessive substance use as part of the, part of the avoidance behavior in the co-occurring PTSD and SUD. Negative alterations in mood and cognitions, um, those are also highly related to substance use um, and are a key feature of PTSD. And marked alterations in arousal and reactivity. So hypervigilance, feeling on edge, on guard, uh, irritability and angry uh, outbursts, sleep impairment and self-destructive behaviors, um, similar to you know, excessive substance use. So how common is PTSD? Um, it's actually, it's very common um, among civilians as well as military veterans. Um, about 70% of individuals in the U.S. have experienced some kind of traumatic event at least once in their life. And up to 20% of those individuals will go on to develop um, PTSD. So an estimated 8% of Americans, about this total population of Texas, um, or 24 million people have PTSD at any given time. And um, it's twice as likely, um, twice as prevalent among women as men. And PTSD is the most common mental health disorder among veterans who are presenting at VA hospitals, up to approximately 30% lifetime prevalence, depending on the sample, um, but it's high. So with PTSD and SUD comorbidity, um, they are very linked. Um, individuals with PTSD are two to five times more likely to have a substance use disorder. The current rates um, in the general population for a substance use disorder you know, past year rates about 3.8% um, versus 7% in veteran populations and up to 18.2% among veterans 18 to 53 years old. Um, Ismini Petrakis um, has, has done work in this area and published um, a study looking at veterans serving in Vietnam, the Vietnam era or later over a million veterans and found that 41% of those with a substance use disorder were diagnosed with PTSD. Um, and with, uh, with cannabis um, and the legalization of cannabis um, across many of our, our states now, um, there's more and more research looking into cannabis use and cannabis use disorder and its relationship with PTSD. And there was a recent study um, by Brian and colleagues published last year that showed um, they did a chart review of over 46,000 military veterans from recent conflicts. Their average age was 31. And they found that 72% of those who had a cannabis use disorder diagnosis also had PTSD. So very, uh, very highly related co-occurring. And with trauma and PTSD and SUD, um, most of the individuals, the vast majority of the individuals that we see that we treat have experienced um, multiple traumas. They often report early childhood traumas and repeated victimization. So it would be very, very rare for us to see someone who had one event. Um, they're struggling with many, you know, multiple chronic uh, cumulative events over time. And patients will often tell us that they use substances, um, not necessarily because they want to, but they're using those in their best attempt. They're only, uh, the only way that they know how in that moment to manage or to try and self-medicate PTSD symptoms. So to try to go to sleep and not remember nightmares, to try to numb out and forget about what happened, and to um, settle down some of those hyperarousal symptoms. Um, it's problematic um, in a, a number of ways, um, primarily because we know that PTSD by itself can be very debilitating. 
Uh, but the clinical course is worse than when you have a co-occurring substance use disorder um, on board as well. So it leads to poor physical health, poor treatment response, earlier relapse, higher unemployment, lower income, more patient, more inpatient hospitalization, um, and higher rates of suicidal ideation and attempted suicide. And so we've asked uh, veterans about their, their view, their perspectives um, on PTSD and SUD. And in one of our studies, we asked them, do you believe that your substance use and PTSD symptoms are related? And almost all of them, 94% said, yes, they are related. And then when we asked them, um, if your PTSD symptoms get worse, what happens to your substance use? And 85% said their substance use increases. About 10% say um, the substance use stays the same. So veterans are noting that relationship as well. Now, in terms of the research and the literature, the vast majority of clinical trials to date for PTSD have excluded individuals who have substance use disorder comorbidity. Um, and so there was a paper that came out in 2017. They looked at 156 randomized clinical trials for PTSD and found that 73.7% excluded participants based on substance use. Only about 7% um, of the studies uh, are shared the substance use related outcomes. Maybe they didn't measure it, um, but they've measured it and reported on the substance use related outcomes. And importantly, no studies observed increases in substance use during PTSD treatment. And that is something that you'll hear me repeat um, as, we're, as we're meeting today, you'll hear me repeat this, um, that engaging in trauma-focused work and treating PTSD among individuals who also have a substance use disorder um, is safe, it's effective, it does not lead to increased substance use. So I may say that a, a couple of times. Um, and I'll show you some data on that too, of course. So how is co-occurring PTSD and SUD typically treated? Uh, well, historically, it's been the sequential treatment approach, um, and that's still the only option in a lot of places. Um, the sequential treatment approach means that a person goes first to, to get substance use treatment and just focuses on that for a period of time, could be weeks, months. Then once the substance use uh, disorder is um, no longer problematic, typically you know, that, that might mean totally abstaining and having a period of time where they're in full remission from substance use, then they could go to PTSD treatment um, and engage in trauma-focused work. However, there are some disadvantages uh, to this, this approach. Um, it is very siloed. Um, it's very lengthy, not, not very inefficient, or sorry, not very efficient um, to, you know, to have so much treatment on one, on one disorder, single disorder, and then have to do at least you know, the same amount probably on the other disorder. There's also little cross provider communication. Uh, so people in, you know, in addiction treatment may not be talking with people in the PTSD treatment clinic. Um, a lot of veterans prefer integrated treatment, and there's research showing that PTSD improvement is associated with SUD improvement. But there's very minimal evidence to show that SUD improvement translates into PTSD symptom improvement. So getting someone um, uh, getting someone, you know, abstinent or significantly reducing their substance use is, is a wonderful first step. Um, but the vast majority of those individuals will still have PTSD symptoms, memories, nightmares, avoidance behaviors that are um, robust triggers for relapse and excessive substance use. And a little error there. Um, there's a huge, huge chasm here. Um, how many people who actually, you know, go to, to substance use treatment, finish it, complete it, obtain abstinence, and then, uh, and then seek out PTSD treatment and, and obtain it too. So there's a lot of room for people to fall through the cracks here. So uh, my colleagues and I have been working on an integrated trauma-focused treatment that I'm 
I'm excited to tell you about today. Trauma-focused treatment, what does that mean? Uh, so that means it's a therapy that uses cognitive, emotional, or behavioral techniques to help process a traumatic experience in which the trauma focus is a central component of the therapy. Integrated means that you're synergistically combining evidence-based treatments for trauma, PTSD, along with evidence-based techniques and treatments for SUD. And it's one treatment episode with one clinician versus um, the sequential would be, you know, one treatment episode for PT, one treatment episode for SUD with one clinician, then going to another clinician clinic agency um, for treatment for PTSD. So this is all in one. <clears throat> so what are the what are the benefits? Why would you use an integrated trauma-focused treatment? Um, well, untreated PTSD is a risk factor, as I just mentioned, for relapse and substance use. Um, we know that the reductions in PTSD are going to be more likely to help uh, improve SUD than the reverse. Patients tell us that they recognize the symptom connection, and, and many prefer to have an integrated treatment. And uh, it's more efficient time, um, more efficient use of time and of resources. And it's also recommended by the VA and the DOD uh, clinical practice guidelines. And um, yeah, but Maya Angelou is one of my, my favorite um, authors. And so her quote here says, there's no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside of you. Uh, so there is a lot of healing um, that, can, that can come from working through this and, and sharing this. And we'll talk about how to do that um, clinically. Sorry, a little typo there. Some of the common myths, though, um, that our work will be addressing too. Um, that is, they're not supported by research. Um, so some of the myths are that talking about trauma will make patients relapse or use more, or that you can't start trauma work until patients are clean um, and sober. Um, and another myth is that abstinence is the only option. So I'll be addressing all of these um, with some of our work and, and colleagues today. So the integrated PTSD SUD care model um, is that we work on treating the PTSD and the substance use together so that the person can manage their PTSD symptoms without using substances. They can recover from both PTSD and the substance use disorder and experience long-term relief. And so COPE stands for Concurrent Treatment of PTSD and SUD using prolonged exposure. It's a very long title, so um, we just refer to it as COPE. Um, it's a 12-session trauma-focused integrated treatment. The sessions are 90 minutes, usually delivered once a week. It's individual format, and it combines prolonged exposure for PTSD with cognitive behavioral therapy techniques for SUD. Um, the goals of COPE are to provide psychoeducation about PTSD and SUD, decrease PTSD symptoms using PE, and then decrease substance use during using CBT. Um, we are uh, just initiating the second, um, second edition. We've learned a lot, um, a lot through over the last, gosh, this was first came out in 2014. So we've got the second edition coming up um, soon. And we're also working on a COPE web, um, which I can tell you more about to help, you know, disseminate training and information. And um, I have, uh, you know, just been really blessed to work with so many wonderful people um, in the U.S. as well as um, in Sweden and in Australia um, to, you know, to get this work moving forward and to help us better understand what we can do to be most helpful. In terms of studies to date, um, these are the trials and the studies thus far. We've had four RCTs and um, two open label trials, two case reports, and we have two studies ongoing right now. And so we've, we've tested this out in more than 500 patients. Um, I've, I've bolded the veteran focused studies. So you can see about half of our, our work thus far has been focused on military veterans. And um, 
yeah, in the US, Sweden and Australia. We have one Australian trial ongoing now for adolescents, which is really exciting and going well where they've um, modified the COPE intervention for adolescents since we know that trauma and substance use mostly start uh, during adolescent age for people. And then we are testing here, COPE combined with oxytocin, which I can tell you a little bit more about going forward. And so who is COPE for? Um, individuals who have a diagnosis of current PTSD and substance use disorder, they need some memory of the trauma because of the imaginal um, exposures, which we're doing, you can do verbally or you can do written, um, but some memory of the trauma is very helpful. And a desire to significantly re reduce or um, cut back, or sorry, or stop using substances. So it's not an abstinence only um, treatment. People can, you know, have a goal of abstinence and that's great. And it's the safest, you know, way to go. And we'll absolutely support them in that. Um, but we will not turn people away if they aren't ready for that. Um, they, they just want to significantly reduce. And I say just, but we know that can be Herculean um, as well. So we really take all comers. Um, if someone doesn't have any desire to reduce their use or to stop using, then you could do some, some motivational interviewing. Oh, and I see that, that Jenna just posted, you know, next month's webinar is on MI. So that's great. <laughs> Um, there are a few safety issues that we would address prior to initiating therapy, um, but this is really it. So if someone has imminent suicidal or homicidal behavior, we want to make sure that they are safe and um, have some stabilization before we start into the therapy. Um, if they need medically supervised detox, then we want to help them get that. Um, and that can either come prior to starting cope, for example, or, you know, we've had it when people have started cope and they're, they're trying on their own to cut back, for example, on, on drinking and, you know, despite best efforts, they really need to go to detox. So we pause our treatment for a week. Uh, most people can, you know, can, can make a ton of headway and complete a detox um, in about a week, maybe two. And then we, we pick it, pick back up where we left off and keep going. And then if there's ongoing domestic violence, we want to make sure that everyone is safe as well. And so we focus on that. So um, I was going to share just a little bit about some of the research to date and then move into the, um, the therapy components of COPE. So briefly, this was the first study. This was done, gosh, over 20 years now, 20 years ago um, with Kathleen Brady uh, and she, you know, real, she was leading the initial proof of concept study because, um, you know, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, there was a lot of worry and concern about doing trauma-focused work with somebody who had a current substance use disorder. Um, but we knew that, you know, the data was even at that time really strong for, um, for, you know, for prolonged exposure and for trauma-focused work. Uh, and so we wanted to test this out. And so um, this sample was mostly women um, with 74% um, you know, had experienced rape, 95% had, had experienced um, physical assault. And what we found is that over time, their um, PTSD symptoms, which was measured in this study by the IES and the CAPS and the Mississippi, um, and their substance use through the ASI, as well as positive urine drug screen tests were going down. And so we saw improvement there. We saw that um, it was safe to do this, that it didn't make people worse. They didn't start using more than they had been using. Um, in fact, we were seeing decreases. So that was, that was a really good first step um, in this. And um, then working with our colleagues in Australia, um, they did the first um, RCT looking at um, COPE versus treatment as usual. And they had a definitely a, a real world sample, if you will, um, in the general population. Uh, they had 103 individuals. Um, most of them, 77% had childhood trauma. The age of the first trauma was eight years old. 
and they had had on average six different traumas with severe PTSD at baseline, exposure to multiple different trauma, trauma types. And their substance use was also very much poly, poly substance users. Um, most had had prior uh, substance use treatment, but note that uh, you know, around a third, only around a third had had prior PTSD treatment. And 80% had a history of injection drug use. And so what they found is that over time, um, the substance use, the severity of the dependence uh, decreased over time in those who were getting COPE um, and as well as severity of PTSD. And um, they shared some lovely quotes from their trial um, that I wanted to share a few of them. So uh, one person said, overall, I thought it was great. No one had ever talked to me about my trauma before. It was good to put a name to my symptoms. And um, another person said it changed their life. It was hard going through it, but since doing it, they made a lot of positive changes. Doing the imaginal exposure really took the fear away. Another person said, I didn't even realize that PTSD treatment was available. I can now talk about the incident without freaking out. And the imaginal exposure was the hardest part, but also the most useful. And we literally just yesterday um, had a patient who's in our ongoing current COPE um, study for veterans uh, tell us things that are very, very similar to this, that, um, that it changed their life that it was like climbing up a, a really you know, high hill, but when you get to the top of it, it gets a lot easier. And um, that they said they know that it takes money and it takes time, but really advertising you know, more about um, exposure-based treatment and trauma work would be wonderful because it is life-changing. So that was really good to continue to hear these things. So we followed up with a randomized clinical trial in veterans uh, conducted here in Charleston. And we had 81 veterans, mostly males, average age of 40. 81% um, had a military related index trauma. 70% um, physical assault, 25% sexual trauma. And most of them are all, yeah, most of them had, actually all of them had alcohol use disorder, but 27% also had alcohol and drug use disorder. Oh, sorry. And there were 10% who had drug use disorder only. Severe caps at baseline. And you can see too, lifetime suicidal um, ideations, 43%, and about 27% had had an attempt in their lifetime. So we compared COPE to relapse prevention. And um, we're working with Crystal Bay Door, who's now at University of Kentucky, uh, to compare improvements um, over time in PTSD using the CAPS and the PCL. And COPE is the blue line and relapse prevention is the red line. So you can see they both improve over time, um, but uh, COPE did lead to lower CAPS and PCL scores and more people in COPE, um, more veterans who are in COPE achieved remission from PTSD um, than from relapse prevention with an odds ratio of you know, over five. And for substance use, they both improved. Um, so people who were doing the trauma-focused work, who were doing the prolonged exposure therapy, their substance use also got significantly better um, in a similar fashion. 40% um, in COPE and 26% in RP were abstinent during the last two weeks of treatment. And then at six months follow-up, we started to see um, even greater benefit of COPE um, with um, fewer drinks per drinking day in, in those that received COPE versus relapse prevention. Therapeutic alliance was good for both and similar, and we did not find any differences in retention. In COPE, the average number of sessions was nine, and RP it was seven, but most individual, individuals completed you know, the majority of the sessions. And then working with um, our colleague, Dr. Sonia Norman, um, she came here and received the training in COPE training in COPE and then um, completed her study here, which was a randomized controlled trial in 119 veterans with PTSD and alcohol use disorder. Average age 42, 90% males. Um, the average number of 
types of traumatic events was eight and 84% had combat trauma as their index trauma. Similar to our veteran population um, in our COPE study, um, their trial had 82% physical assault and 24% had a history of sexual assault. And Dr. Norman compared COPE to seeking safety. Um, seeking safety is an integrated intervention uh, for PTSD and SUD that is non-trauma focused. Um, it's typically longer of 25 sessions, but 12 sessions was used for both treatments. It's coping skills based, um, it's present, present centered. So there's no exposure or, or trauma work um, directly included. So it's more about focusing on current symptoms. And um, they found that uh, they found greater reduction in PTSD and higher rates of remission with COPE. They found comparable days of abstinence during COPE and seeking safety. Um, overall, people attended about 10 out of 12. They did find that there were fewer sessions attended in COPE than in seeking safety. Um, and then secondary analyses found that COPE led to greater reduction in trauma-related guilt than um, seeking safety. And um, one of our colleagues here, Tanya Soraya, just recently published a paper that found similar results too um, from our prior study. And so when you look at PTSD, you know, diagnostic remission, um, this is for ITT, the um, intent to treat analysis. So not per protocol, it's um, more conservative way of looking at it, that about 59, you know, 50 to 59% of individuals who complete COPE will no longer have PTSD. Um, when they are done versus, you know, relapse prevention and seeking safety were around 17 to 22%. And with alcohol use disorder remission, um, it's about 45% in COPE, 38% um, for seeking safety. So kind of more similar outcomes related to substance use. And I would love for us to do what we can to um, find ways to imp improve those even further. Uh, but the trauma-focused treatment, the integrated work among individuals, among veterans who have a co-occurring substance use disorder um, is positive. So what does the therapy involve, the components of COPE? So COPE includes prolonged exposure therapy, um, both the in vivo and imaginal exposures. It includes cognitive behavioral therapy techniques for substance use, primarily to help people learn to manage cravings which absolutely happen and are part of a normal part of recovery. So manage those craving, manage thoughts about using, which are also common and frequent, and skills to help them reduce or to quit their use. Um, we provide psychoeducation around the common reactions to trauma, which can include uh, avoidance and substance use as a way of avoiding, the interrelationship between PTSD and um, substance use, there's also handouts for loved ones and family members. We teach breathing retraining um, at the very beginning as a way to manage cravings and anxiety. So here's the table of contents, uh, just to give you a broad overview. Um, and you'll see that you know most of the sessions are addressing both PTSD and the substance use, it's important that um, both of them be given, uh, you know, attention, time. By the time we see people, usually it's been, you know, at least years, if not a decade or more, that they've been struggling with these. And so they have both the PTSD and a substance use disorder um, that need to be addressed. And so we have tried to synergize and interweave um, those pieces and components throughout each session. So we start with an overview and the rationale, which is really key. Go, their goals for therapy, which we'll talk about, um, specifically related to the substance use and breathing retraining, common, aware, common reactions to trauma, um, the in vivo hierarchy, I wanted to note too, the in vivo hierarchy starts in session three here, and then we initiate the imaginal exposure in session four. So it's just one session later than you would normally do in prolonged exposure. Uh, but you're doing more, you know, you're doing broader psycho ed rationale and really starting to work on those cravings 
um, both awareness and managing the cravings um, early on. And then you can see the imaginals and the in vivos continue throughout along with content related to um, substance use. And the content related to the substance use can be moved um, as needed. So we do talk about anger and managing anger because it is a very common symptom of PTSD and a robust trigger um, for substance use. So if you are working with someone, for example, who came in and they were really struggling with anger um, in their life, you can move those sessions up. So there's some flexibility there. And I won't talk too much or go into too much stuff about prolonged exposure here, um, but just you know, very brief overview that you know that prolonged exposure is highly effective treatment, and there's over 30 years of empirical research on it. Best practice interventions supported by clinical guidelines. The in vivo exposures are where we have patients go out and directly confront feared but safe situations in real life, and the imaginal exposure is having the patient revisit and approach the memory of the trauma um, during sessions. And there's also a PE web, which you may already know about, um, but I just wanted to share that there's a PE web available um, online. So the rationale for the exposure um, is very, very important because of course we're asking people to do the exact opposite of what they have been doing. Um, and uh, we know that avoidance maintains those PTSD symptoms. So we normalize, validate, you know, attempts to avoid, to, to not leave their house, to not go to doctor's appointments, not go shopping, not go to the grocery store, drinking or smoking or using a lot. Um, we validate and normalize those. And then talk though about how they, they've been doing that, they've been trying that, how has that worked for them? And it helps, you know, can help the conversation about how, okay, we're going to, we're going to work with you on kind of doing the opposite there. Um, we note that, you know, substance use and avoiding um, or other types of avoidance can be very successful in the short run, but it maintains the PTSD in the long run. And we also provide some education because patients don't often realize this, that substances can worsen PTSD symptoms. So withdrawal from substances can mimic some of the hyperarousal symptoms, um, the sleep problems. Um, substance use can affect, um, definitely affect mood um, and elevate you know, depression, also impairs cognition, ability to, to think clearly and make, make the best decisions. Um, it also decreases the ability of the executive functioning system, which is you know, planning and, um, and decision-making amplifies that limbic system, emotions, the fear, um, and it can impact the HPA, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal stress system. So even if, you know, people are trying their best attempts to reduce their PTSD, to live with it, to manage it by using substances, they may not realize that the substance use is actually making their PTSD worse. So the in vivos are helping people go out and realize um, or learn that the situations they have been avoiding, although uncomfortable, you know, anxiety provoking are safe and helps to just confirm the belief that, you know, those situations are dangerous. We also note that nothing is 100% safe. We can't guarantee that. But we identify and work with um, patients to come up with in vivo exercises that are relatively safe. They would, they would send their mother to do this or their sibling or their, their peers, you know. And they learn that the anxiety doesn't continue forever. It enhances how they feel about themselves, their competency and their self-control, promotes engagement in positive activities, hobbies and relationships. Um, and those two pieces, you know, both PTSD and Substance use disorders are associated with loss of control. So helping people to regain some control in their life, some control over their behaviors um, can be monumental. And for many with substance use disorders, they have given up, um, they've given up hobbies, they've given up 
going to the gym, giving up working out, giving up socializing, not calling people anymore, um, giving up woodworking, carpentry. And so helping them get back into those um, exercises and, and hobbies can be really positive for them. They also learn that they can tolerate these situations and they can do it without using substances. The anxiety goes down, as do the cravings, all on their own without using. And so with in vivos and the substance use, it's, it's important um, when you're working with someone who has a current substance use disorder to um, let them know to not use alcohol or drugs before, during, or immediately after, and we say about two hours, for about two hours after, doing in vivos to ensure that they experience mastery over it and that they have new learning. If they use before they go or during or after, you know, it, it doesn't teach them really anything new. They're still, you know, they're still using um, to get through it. So they're not learning that they can do it themselves without anything else. And it's important to select in vivo situations that are safe regarding substance use. So, um, so Walmart is a place that a lot of people go for in vivos. Um, driving is one that comes up a lot for people who've been in IED explosions um, or witnessed those. Uh, but it's, um, it's important too to note that these things are really tailored. So for example, with the trash cans, uh, the picture of the trash cans here, one of our veterans could not leave his house on garbage day because um, all of these looked like threats. He didn't know if there'd be a bomb in them. And he wanted to be able to leave his house on garbage day and every other day. So uh, we worked on that. Um, dog parks, you know, um, when we've been working with people who are, um, have experienced, you know, loss or other traumas related to service dogs, dog park might be a place to go. Um, we have a veteran now that we're working with who, I uh, was in the Navy and um, needs to be able to get in water. And so he's recently just, just starting at a pool. Just go into the community pool, has his partner go with him, sit further down. So not exactly right there, but he knows that she is there and literally just put his feet, just put his feet in the water and stay there for about 45 minutes. And we're working up, you know, that's where you start on the hierarchies. You start at a place that is anxiety provoking, but doable. And then you work higher up that hierarchy um, to the more challenging ones. And so uh, sometimes it can be, could be confusing in terms of you're, you know, you're telling them to approach certain things, but you're also telling them to avoid other things. And what we're doing here is really switching it. Um, they've been avoiding a lot of the trauma-focused cues and approaching the substance use. So now we want to switch that so that they're approaching the trauma cues and they're staying away from the substance use cues. So we talk about how approaching these trauma-focused cues is, um, is safe. It may not have felt safe and you know, with good reason, um, but it's the new learning that take pla takes place to show that even though it might feel unsafe or feel uncomfortable, it's safe. And then uh, we work on staying away from substance use cues uh, or places, you know, that may not be safe for them in this moment at least, you know, and it could increase their substance use or lead to a relapse. And we also look at safety behaviors. Um, so safety behaviors are things that people do or say to temporarily reduce distress in situations. So we wanna know what they are and identify them um, and, and work with the patient to remove them so that they don't you know, limit the effectiveness of in vivos. So the safety behaviors you know, could be like using or drinking or smoking um, or having it with you. And it just maintains those negative emotions and prevents the corrective learning that they can handle this without whatever that safety behavior is. And I'll show you a slide in a minute of a variety of different types of safety behaviors because they can come in many different shapes and sizes. And so this is from some of our colleagues. This list is from some of our colleagues um, at the Emory uh, Healthcare Veterans Program. 
Um, so some that are you know ob most obvious for cope would be using alcohol or drugs before doing an in vivo, before going to the pool, before going to the dog park, before going to Walmart, um, or having the alcohol, drugs, or pills like in their in their car with them, in their pocket, in their purse, just in case. Safety behaviors. Other things could be, you know, I won't go through the whole list here, but things like, you know, keeping the lights on all the time in the house, um, sleeping with the bedroom door locked, keeping a weapon under the mattress, um, backing up in parking spots so they can get out faster if they need to, um, sitting or standing with the back, their back to the wall, sitting in a corner position so they can see everyone, wearing sunglasses and headphones going in to shopping. Um, it's important to help, help your patient realize these things and um, help them remove them. So uh, imaginal exposure, just very briefly, is repeatedly revisiting that memory, approaching the memory that is uncomfortable and distressing, um, but just a memory. So you do that followed by about 10 to 15 minutes of processing. And imaginal exposure, it can be done verbally, um, like they're doing here in the picture uh, with Dr. Flanagan and Mr. Ayers, or you can do it written as well. It helps to organize the memory, make sense of it, bring up some new perspectives, differentiating that it, it, it was then and it is a memory, gaining experience, um, mastery experience and confidence, habituating, and having that anxiety go down over time and learning that they can manage it without using substances. And if you're doing a lot of telehealth work, like most of us are doing now, we do pretty much everything, 95% um, of everything is, is done by telehealth, then one option that you can do too is you know, have patients do a breathalyzer or an alcohol test strip um, prior to doing it. Because when people will come into the office, we, you know, we'll always do um, a breathalyzer with them or urine drug screen based on the protocol. Um, so how do you do that, you know, with telehealth? These things are very inexpensive. Alcohol test strips are like, like $1.50. Um, and so it's easy. We just mail them to people and we have them do them. You can do them right, um, you know, right on the camera so you can watch, watch them. It's a saliva strip that just goes in their mouth for a few seconds. So there are other ways, you know, other ways to be creative and think through this. I will say, and one thing that's very important to say is that um, it's really rare for people to actually come to session under the influence. So um, in our prior study of COPE, it was less than 3% of the time. So although it's a concern, um, it's very rare. And then of course we'll have a protocol in place for what to do when that does happen. Um, and just make sure that, you know, that um, you're approaching it in a very compassionate way. You get it, this is part of recovery. Um, and we want to, um, we schedule as soon as possible. So hopefully the next day, get them in and make sure that, you know, you don't let those negative feelings, um, shame, embarrassment, and things like that get in the way of um, continuing therapy and treatment. So they're learning to manage the wave of anxiety and to manage the, way, the wave of craving. So we talk about this, um, how it's high at first, it goes up, it goes up, but eventually it's coming down all by itself without using. And we have the SUDS, um, subjective units of distress scale. We have like a thermometer that we show them and we have an analogous craving thermometer too that we show them so that they can learn to and there's definitely a learning piece there. Understand like, what is a 30 for them, you know, for suds? What is a 70 for them? That can, that can change from what they think it might be to when they actually go and do it, um, when they're doing those in vivos or they're, they're doing the imaginals. And then a craving thermometer as well for them to really get to know what, when are they at a 20? So they can start, you know, implementing some um, interventions or when are they? at a 60 and what to do there. And I will say too that um, Dr. Amber Jarnicki, who's in our group, looked at craving and suds over time um, in our veteran sample um, to see like what happens to the craving 
um, as well as the suds during imaginal exposures. And the imaginal exposures started in session four, so you'll see four through 11 here. And the scale for craving is zero to 100. And so we were, I mean, we were surprised, um, found that craving was not very high. It really was even at a 25. And we also say, saw their craving go down over time within session and between sessions, um, as well as distress. So I wanted to talk just a little bit about some of the key components of the substance use piece, um, just to review. So we normalize the cravings. We help them identify triggers for cravings, both the substance use triggers and trauma-related triggers help them learn to effectively manage those cravings, recognize and modify high risk thoughts and learn effective coping skills like drug refusal skills. Um, so with craving awareness, uh, you know, it's important to sort of set up like what is, how do they define craving? What does that mean to them? So we think of it as a strong desire and urge to use and it's the normal part of recovery um, you can emphasize that cravings, just like anxiety, are time limited, like a wave that rises, peaks, and comes down. And on average, cravings last 15 minutes or less. So you want, you want them to expect that cravings will occur, so they're not caught off guard by it, and they don't think, oh no, treatment's not working, um, because I'm having a craving, um, that can be very, very normal. And then just have a have a plan of how how will they um, how will they deal with it? Yes, and I see someone just posted this too shall pass. It will. So with cravings, um, sometimes people will say, "I never have a craving, never." So that's where you can you know just review what the definition is, how you're thinking about it. Um, note that they can just be thoughts, you know, like that joint smells really good. They could be fleeting thoughts, like you, you know, you see an advertisement flash on the TV, or you drive by a billboard or something. Um, that might help, you know, kind of um, get their memory going. You can also ask about the last time that they used. Where were they? What kind of thoughts were they having just before they ended up using? What were their emotions they were feeling at the time? And you can relate it to something else. Like most people will have some kinds of cravings, you know, in their life. Um, so it could be, you know, Lay's chips or gosh, um, devices, you know, smartphones, coffee, cupcakes, whatever. And identifying triggers, um, this is one of the, you know, pieces that you do early on there. So people, places, and things, of course, um, they could be um, substance use related like bars or paraphernalia, seeing people using, but they could also be um, trauma-related cues, uh, people who look like a perpetrator, their perpetrator, or places where the trauma happened or that remind them of it. Um, negative emotions as well. Could be loneliness, that's a big one, related to substance use, loneliness, boredom, or stress, or it could be negative emotions related to PTSD, like anger and shame and guilt. Thoughts, um, also related to substance use, like just uh, you know, kind of romanticizing it, just thinking about the good old days um, and not remembering, you know, what happened after those good old days uh, and also thoughts about the trauma. Physical symptoms too. So feeling on edge, feeling restless, feeling jumpy, those hyperarousal symptoms, um, withdrawal symptoms and physical pain. So we'll talk about a couple of, um, of uh, craving ways to manage cravings and triggers and stuff. And one is play it out. So this is having the person, you know, start with their thought, a cold beer sure would taste good right now. And then what does that lead to for them based on all their experience, their years of experience? What happens then? Okay. So this person was like, well, usually have about six more. And then somebody probably has, you know, cocaine there. And so then I'm doing cocaine and then wind up in jail again, I'm not showing up for work, losing my job, broke, family's angry and hurt, I'm feeling down and shame and guilt. And so just playing it out can really help, um, help that process of deciding, do I really want to do this or not? In addition, reducing exposure to triggers. So like we talked about before, what places do they wanna stay away from? What people 
do they want to stay away from? If they have substances in their house, how are they going to dispose of it? Um, you can get some pushback for that, of course, like it's a very special bottle. My uncle gave it to me or just because I stopped using doesn't mean everybody else has to and I want to be a good host. So just helping them think through that and where are they going to dispose of it? Um, don't bury it in the backyard, wrap it in a towel and put it in your trash can. Um, it's just like, you know, if I was, I don't know, if I was trying to have less sweets or sugar, then I probably don't need a lot of cookies like right there um, in my kitchen. And identifying those high risk thoughts for them. These are just a couple of examples. Um, they can be high risk thoughts related to escaping, just want to forget about everything. I don't want to feel anything, just want to numb out. They can be related to crises like I need to use to get through this or once I get through this tough time, I'm going to quit for good. Feeling uncomfortable when not using. Um, so some folks have said, you know, I'm more fun to be around when I'm using or my kids like me better when I'm high. Um, and testing control, thinking like, I bet I can go hang out with my buddies and not use. I bet I can do this. Or thinking I can avoid it. I can't avoid it forever. So I might as well go ahead and test myself. So we really try to discourage people from trying to test themselves because life will test them at some point. Um, and so if they're having these kinds of thoughts, um, just think that's a sign to, um, to go ahead and start some of the coping skills that they've learned. And um, with managing thoughts, you can, um, you know, you can work with them on cognitive restructuring. So gradually becoming more aware of what their thoughts are. And I cannot emphasize how, um, how much of a struggle that can be. Like um, a lot of people are not <laughs> walking around just aware of what they're thinking. So helping them slow down and become more aware of their thoughts and then teaching them to replace those maladaptive or unhelpful thoughts with more helpful ones. And we talk about how it's a fact that you have thoughts, but not all thoughts are facts. So questioning those thoughts, do you really need a hit? And will it really make you forget? You know, maybe, maybe in the short term, maybe for a moment, but then what? Can you really use just one? How did that go in the past? So just helping to slow down and think through these things. Establishing SUD treatment goals is important early on too. And I wanted to spend just a little bit of time talking about that. Um, so I guess, you know, the, the main thing is, do they wanna abstain or do they wanna significantly reduce? In our prior research, um, we found that only about 50% of the veterans um, who were treatment seeking with PTSD and SUD identified abstinence as a treatment goal. So, um, we of course want to do our best to help all of those individuals. Um, and we would be, you know, closing off, closing off treatment doors to half of everyone who, um, needed, needed help if we only, you know, had abstinence as a goal. And we found that those who want to significantly reduce are typically younger. They're typically employed. They've served in more recent conflicts and they have fewer symptoms of substance use. Um, so we talk about how abstinence is the safest option. Like you can't have any problems from it um, if you're not using, but it's not required. And yes, we work on harm reduction. Absolutely. So we normalize those ambivalent feelings. If someone wants to try it, then we talk about how trying it during therapy is a great time. So we can do that too. But we work with them um, where they're at. And to help come up with goals, you can look at the degree of their substance use. Is it mild, moderate, or severe? You can look at and help them look at, you know, what kinds of negative consequences have they thought, or sorry, what kinds of negative consequences have they, you know, had before? Legal problems, incarceration, do they have cirrhosis of the liver? Do they have job loss, you know, co child custody issues? And how have their previous substance use treatment attempts gone? What's the longest time they've been? Do they have a history of seizures? Do they have multiple detox and hospitalizations? You know, if they do, that's probably where you're gonna do some MI and really talk with them about what their goals and their, what their goals are and how, you know, how these concerning symptoms are, you would, you would wanna encourage them to be abstinent 
and um, help them get there too. And what about their family history density? Do they have a lot of people in their family who've really struggled with substance use too? So collabor collaboratively working together with that. And if the goal is to significantly reduce, you wanna be really specific about what that means. Exact amount, frequency, aim for having some days with no use. Those days are good for therapy appointments, good for those in vivo exercises, and then revisit the goal throughout therapy. Um, you know, you might find that, that it changes over time. So, you know, at least halfway through, check in and see how it's going and um, if they wanna make any changes then. <clears throat> so in summary from this first part um, of talking about COPE and the research behind it and the components, um, COPE is, is one option. It's a trauma-focused treatment that includes um, prolonged exposure uh, to reduce PTSD. It starts the, the um, in vivo start in session three and the imaginal start in session four and it's integrated within each session um, for CBT for substance use. And we talked about how the substance use focuses on managing those cravings and thoughts and triggers for you for use. Um, abstinence is the safest often, but it's not required. Um, Psychoed and breathing retraining are provided, and um, it helps patients approach safe but avoided trauma-related stimuli without using substances, providing new learning. So I wanted to take a moment to in our last maybe 15 minutes um, to talk about some ongoing and future directions as well. Uh, so I'm working with um, some wonderful collaborators um, to further improve outcomes um, with pharmacotherapy. Also working with some collaborators too on biometric driven virtually guided in vivo exposures. And um, I mentioned that my colleagues in Australia are um, have an ongoing project for COPE A or for adolescents. And then I wanted to mention Project Harmony too, um, which is an amazing project that I've been involved with, an NIAAA funded project um, led by Dr. Antonio Morgan Lopez and Denise Yen um, that is pooling um, over 40 different trials together to look at mediators and moderators of outcome. So the first um, piece I wanted to share is that uh, Dr. Julian Flanagan and I are, um, have an ongoing study that we're using oxytocin to augment COPE. Um, so these are veterans, our target N is 180, who have current PTSD and alcohol use disorder, and they receive oxytocin, um, 40 IUs or saline placebo, prior to each therapy session. So what's really interesting here is that we're looking not at oxytocin is something you would just take every day, but it, it's something that you do prior to the actual therapy session. Um, and oxytocin is a hypothalamic 9 amino acid neuropeptide, um, self-administered intranasally, and we observe that. Um, but oxytocin has been associated with um, enhancing social connection, reducing um, reducing activity in the amygdala, reducing fear. And it's also been shown to help reduce craving as well. So given that there's so much, you know, interpersonal, um, there's a huge interpersonal piece with the trauma work that you're doing. And a lot of people uh, have never talked about their trauma before they do this, um, before they, you know, are engaged with us in these in these trials um, or coming in for treatment, they've really never talked about it. And so that's a huge, um, huge hurdle to overcome. Um, and we're wondering if oxytocin might help with that. It might also help, you know, people with, um, with reducing their PTSD symptoms in other ways while also having reduction in craving through this. So they're coming in for 12 sessions or actually we're doing most of this virtually um, through telehealth. And, um, Another piece of this that we're doing, I'll just briefly mention, is that we're doing uh, fMRI um, before and after treatment so that we can look at um, we can look at the brain and we can look at changes that are happening in response to trauma or um, or substance related cues as well. <clears throat> and then another another aspect that I wanted to share with you is um, 
how we're using um, technology to enhance prolonged exposure for PTSD um, using psychophys biomarker driven um, data. And we just recently published a paper on this. Um, and um, these are my colleagues that I'm working with here. We have gotten some positive findings. And so uh, Dr. Jarnicki has received some pilot funding to take it to the next step in terms of applying this to a population that um, also has co-occurring SUD. So we know that these in vivos are really, really important in exposure therapy, whether that's for PTSD, for other types of anxiety disorders, um, social phobia, um, et cetera. However, the in vivos usually happen outside the visibility of the clinician. Most clinicians will not be able to or have time to go with patients when they're doing in vivos. Most, most clinicians aren't gonna go to Walmart um, with the patient um, or to the dog park or et cetera. So that leaves a lot of questions, you know, and a lot of room for, um, for error or at least ineffective in vivo exercises. Um, so we have been working with um, a group here, um, a business called Xeriscope, a telehealth platform company, and they developed a device and we've tested it in 40 veterans. So the device allows the clinician to virtually go with the patients while they're doing these in vivos. And um, you can see on the picture of the laptop at the bottom, there's a clinician dashboard. And so it has a camera that the patient's wearing, very small and conspicuous. So you can see what they're seeing and where they are while they're doing the in vivos. And it also has a live streaming um, heart rate and skin conductance so that you can see how physiologically activated or not they are and use that data to help guide them. And you can do it in real time, which is really nice. Instead of what we often have to do is, you know, wait until they come back the next week. And you ask, well, how did it go? How was it when you went, when you went to Walmart or Target um, or wherever, you know, the grocery store? And so then they have to remember, how was it? And was I really there for 45 minutes? It felt like 45 minutes, but maybe it was more like 20. Um, and it, so it's, it's relying on a lot of memory. Um, it's also delayed. And then you can't you know, intervene in the moment to really maximize the exposure. Um, so with this, we, we think it might help with accountability. You know, you're showing up to that in vivo and your, your therapist is showing up too, just like if you have a workout buddy who's meeting you at the gym. You know, if they're there, you're probably more likely to show up. Um, and also probably if you have a coach, for example, you know, you're going to have a harder workout, like a better workout though, more effective workout. Um, if they're there kind of, you know, encouraging you and helping to guide you during the in vivo. So um, this is, for example, this is just a little um, picture here of um, Dr. Lozano, who's one of our, pay, our um, therapists um, on the study. And so um, one of Dr. Lozano's patient was at Walmart. And you can see, you can see the video here of the person. You can see what they're seeing as they're walking down kind of a busy aisle of people. And it's really nice because you can see what their skin conductance or their heart rate is doing in that moment. And as you'll notice, it's not like you're, it's not like the physiological symptoms just go up and stay up. There's moments where it goes up, it goes down. And so we can ask, okay, this is high, what are you doing now? And we also will get their suds. Um, and then we can note when, um, when places are high and when they're low. And this is a checkout. And checkout for most people has been a high, um, it's been a high you know, stress time, which is really interesting because it's not something that we would have initially thought about but it does make sense. You're, you're in the checkout, you can see the door, you're almost out, but you're not yet out. And you're also having to interact with a person. Um, and the thoughts that patients have while they're checking out and they're interacting with a clerk are really, um, are really important and really useful in terms of therapy. So this um, was a veteran who um, had an MST and you know her thoughts were that this clerk could see it all over her face, could totally tell 
that she had been assaulted and, you know, she was having a lot of stress related to that. So um, it just gives you so much information, being able to be in the moment with them. And also when you're seeing, okay, their heart rate's going down, their physiological symptoms are going down, their suds are going down, what are they doing? And then you think, or you can see, okay, they are in the very back of the store right now. They are, there's no one around them. They're in whichever section is um, like desolate. So we wanna move them and get them closer. Or we can tell that they're gonna, they really wanna do the self checkout where you just go and you don't have to interact with anyone. You have a lot more control, um, but we want them to go through the checkout with a clerk. So that has been really interesting and fun. And um, I should go back here. And we are going to be um, testing this with individuals who also have a current substance use disorder. Um, so we're working with Xeriscope. And I, as I mentioned, Amber Jarnicki has some pilot funding to, to also now um, put like a breathalyzer piece um, that's on the device so that, you know, they can give us a reading and, and do a test and not meant not meant in any way to be like, you know, punishing, but can help with accountability um, as they show up and do these things too. So thank you so much. I know I've shared a lot of, a lot of different information. Um, be happy to take some questions and, um, and share anything further that, that might be helpful for the group. Wonderful. Um absolutely fabulous presentation. Thank you so much. I am really excited to see, uh, you know, some of the extensions that are happening in addition to, you know, just the original protocol. Yeah. One quick question. There was a, um, someone was wondering when the second edition um, might be coming mm. out, if, if at all. So I'll just, yeah. I'll start with that one because it's a quickie. Okay. Yes, we're working on the second edition and um, we're going to be working on that um, a lot, probably over the next six to eight months, um, you know, meeting with um, different clinicians who have used it and also patient feedback and then uh, just meeting together um, from our own, you know, supervision of all the different cases um, to see what we might want to change. So I would expect it would be 2023 um, when that actually comes out. Okay, great. And if somebody wanted to find out more about the COPE A, is there a place uh, we can send them as well? Yeah, well, Dr. Catherine Mills um, in Australia is running that protocol, um, M I L L S, Catherine Mills, and I'm happy to happy to share, you know, her her uh, email if that would be helpful too. Okay, that would be that would be great. Okay, um, I do have, or you know, or at least somebody can can probably look her up and find her. And I, I did note that you did put your email here, so thank you um, for, yeah. for doing that. If if somebody has further questions. We did have a question. Um, well, we have a few questions, but uh, that, you know, a lot of folks are working with individuals um, who are using cannabis. Um, yeah. And obviously you can use alcohol strips to test for alcohol, but yeah. any suggestions, like, what do you do? How do you tell or test about cannabis before session um, or, or any kind of insights around that particular presentation? Yeah, that is a great question. And there's no easy answer or straightforward answer that I have because, you know, with the urine drug screens, um, cannabis can stay in your system for weeks, um, depending on, you know, how long you've been smoking, depending on your, your body and adipose tissue. And so that one is a lot, is a lot more difficult at this point to be able to, to know for sure if someone has that, you know, on board in the moment. And so just kind of making sure that you're having really good education about when one uses and doesn't use in the context of, of therapy yes. and PE for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And the rationale behind, you know, why that is so important because they're working so hard, you know, they're, they're doing this, they are, you know, in it. And if they're used before they go and do the in vivos, then that's only going to make them feel like they could only do it because they were using. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and kind of along these lines, um, how do you work with a client? And I know you mentioned MI, but how do you work with a client who expresses a desire to continue substance use that is likely to interfere with treatment or perpetuate PTSD symptoms? Yeah, I think a lot of it is, you know, revisiting that conversation. Um, most of the time people, people get it. And, um, 
you know, they can make, they, they're making as much changes as they can on the rare occasion um, when they need to have detox. Um, like I mentioned before, we can, you can pause treatment for a week and they can get detox and come back, you know, and keep going with it. But, um, but yeah, I think, you know, sometimes having those, um, those conversations where you want them to be able to get the most out of it as possible. And they do too. And you see that some of these things and some of these behaviors are, are interfering. What are their thoughts around that? And can we try, can we try a different approach? Excellent. Um, and I just saw a question from Don and I'm going to, I'm going to flip the yeah. question a little bit. I think it's, it's kind of more CPT with um, yeah. the CBT for substance use disorder. Is there a reason why PE was a better pairing there? Or is there any work being done looking at CPT and CBT for substance use disorder? Yeah, it's a great question. We started with prolonged exposure therapy, uh, you know, 20 years ago because th there was more research on it um, at the time. Um, CPT is a wonderful trauma-focused treatment. And um, my colleague, um, uh, Dr. Vujanovic, who's at the University of Houston, um, Anka and I are working together. We actually just recently put in um, a revised submission. So we have a grant under review to um, develop a CPT, an integrated CPT and SUD um, treatment for individuals with PTSD and substance use disorders. So yeah, we, we polled clinicians, um, did a national survey of clinicians and found that, you know, it seems that more, most of them, you know, more are using CPT than PE and that having a, um, having a therapy manual, um, a protocol for combining CPT with uh, CBT for substance use would be helpful. And so we are, um, we're attempting to do that now too. Excellent. Okay. So more on the horizon there. That's exciting. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. circle back to the oxytocin because we had a couple questions about that. Um, just a quick, another clarification on what it is, but then also what are, um, what were the, the um, clients told is the reason for the administration? How is that kind of explained to them in the trial? Gotcha. So oxytocin um, is a neuropeptide. Um, it's a hormone that, um, you know, our body produces, um, but there may be, and there, there are differences in terms of levels of oxytocin that, you know, endogenous oxytocin that people will have. Um, it's a critical um, hormone for, for bonding and for connection um, with people and um, produced by the hypothalamus and um, released by the pituitary gland. And so um, some people will, you know, have heard of it as like the love drug or the love ho hormone, the cuddle, the cuddle hormone. Um, but it's about like that connection with, with others and it can help people um, essentially read, read others, like socially, what are they, you know, are, is this person a threat? Are they looking me at looking at me in a strange way, or you know maybe not? So it's super important in terms of connection and bonding um, and interpersonal um, interpersonal um, attachment. Oh, and your second part of the question, uh, we we tell them we it's not you know there's no deception at all, and so we just we tell them that um, be, based on some of the research, we think that this might help with reducing their PTSD, with enhancing the therapy um, process and reducing their substance use. We don't know, of course, for sure. And that's why we're doing the research. And it's also double-blinded. So neither, neither the researchers nor the um, patients know if they have oxytocin or if they have placebo. Great. I'm going to do one more question, then I'm going to turn things over to Micah for CE. Is Christy is asking something that kind of um, was something that really resonated when you showed some of those quotes was the individual who said no one had ever talked to them about their trauma before, had never yes. asked, them, asked them about that. And I, I think I've heard Patty Rizek say, um, you know, oftentimes when you see depression, if you ask some questions about trauma, you, you find out really it was PTSD and not, not the depression. Yeah. And you know, Christy's kind of saying any best practices or tools to tease out that your patient does meet PTSD criteria while active um, substance use asking because other diagnoses can mirror PTSD, especially if the patient is actively engaged um, in substance use. So maybe some more like assessment type 
recommendations, yeah. good questions to ask would be great. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, I would start, you know, with doing a um, like a life events checklist um, to to look at what kinds of traumatic experiences they might have had in their lifetime, and then the PCL is, you know, a self report um, PTSD checklist. Sometimes, you know, it might also be picking up on more general stress, um, but you could you could give them the self report. PCL and then engage in more discussion around, um, you know, if they're, if they're, if they're finding that it's hard to sleep and they're having sleep disruption, what is that about? You know, and, and that'll help you to know, is it, is it more because they're having nightmares, um, every night about what happened? Um, so you can know if, if these symptoms are PTSD trauma focused, uh, the CAPS is a terrific assessment as well. It is clinician administered, so it's lengthier, um, but the CAPS, you know, is a, is a gold standard for assessing PTSD. Great, and, and really rich conversations, I imagine, that come from, you know, even just the psychoeducation about how all those things fit together for you without, um, in a mm. non-judgmental way, must be really powerful as well. Anyway, you're seeing lots, I hope you're seeing all the fabulous comments in the chat, thanking you and, oh, yeah. and uh, what a wonderful training. I'm going to turn things over to Mr. Turn things over to Mr. Norgard quickly to talk about uh, CEs and then we will wrap up. All right. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. All right, thank you everyone for joining today. Uh, the next steps in uh, receiving CE credits is uh, once we close out the room, just wait about, uh, I would say about 30 minutes today, just for us to, to ensure all the attendance has been taken. And then after that 30 minutes, go ahead and log back into your My Account page. And once you log back into your My Account page, you'll see today's presentation, uh, the same place where you click launch webinar today. And to the right of that, you'll see an orange certificate button. Click on that button, complete the evaluation, and then you'll be able to print or uh, print or email your certificate to yourself uh, right from that platform. If you have any questions or it's still showing that your seminar is not complete for some reason, uh, my email is also on the screen. Go ahead, send me an email. But again, just please wait for about 30 minutes to an hour before you email. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Mr. Norgard. Uh, so a huge round of applause for Dr. Back. We, we felt so lucky. She is a busy, busy, popular lady. So we are really honored that you were able to join us in our series. I hope that many of you can come join us in July. Uh, again, we will be doing dancing with ambivalence and psychotherapy, moving between motivational interviewing and EBPs with balance and grace. Uh, so I'll put the link to that in the chat and um, really again uh very very grateful and thankful and we will be closing the room in about a minute so that that tracking can get started and everyone can get their ce so thanks for joining us from around the world and we hope to see you next month and in months after so thanks and have a great day <laughs>